Well, good morning, everybody, and good afternoon or good evening to you, Michael. Good evening and good morning to everybody in California. Exactly. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure it's warmer there than it is here. I'm looking at a slight overcast, so you know it's it's uh, you know 75, 80. It's terrible. Oh, well, it's uh, definitely warm. it's definitely warmer in California. It's wet and wind. It's wet and windy here. Well, well, may I may I ask you, have you been busy cutting firewood for the for the pending winter? Well, actually, I don't have. I li I, I live in a maisonette. I don't actually have a fire stove. I I have electric heating, but. But I'm all right because I, I have storage heating, which is an old fashioned way of heating. But but the storage, the nighttime rate for electricity has come down, whereas my daytime rate is shot up. But the nighttime rate has actually come down. So right. I, should be, I should be nice and snug this weather. I, I figure I'll be sending a whole lot of uh, battery powered heating blankets to my friends in Europe these days. Uh, well, uh, 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 given that we've got global cooling uh, and slight planetary decline in temperatures, yes, we're likely, I think we're going to get quite a cold winter, but the energy crisis, the, 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 the new British government headed by Liz Truss, uh, they've got on top of the energy crisis, at least for the time being, and the gas prices are coming down. So, I mean, California, I'm not familiar with such terminology. Uh, mine is currently $7.10. Um, but I live under Newsom's rule, so. Ah, now, of course, we are divided. Actually, I'm bilingual. I shouldn't have, I speak American as well as English. I should have used gas. I, I should have said fuel prices because gas, <laughs> when I was talking about gas prices coming down, I was talking about liquefied natural gas. Uh, ah, well, well, uh, well, well, which well, we well. need for energy. Uh, uh, when you when you thought I was talking about petrol prices, i.e., uh, gasoline, yes, okay. I, I, I've been to, uh, gasoline wait. prices are not coming. Uh, the uh, the dollar the the barrel of oil has gone up slightly, but um, uh, in the as we call it over here, petrol petrol prices have actually gone down to about one sixty eight a liter for I, my Daimler requires premium fuel, the high octane fuel. You could stick of it course. in a. You could stick the fuel I put in the dame in an aeroplane. Um, <laughs> aeroplane light aviation fuel is about 100 octane. And I use 99 in the car, but it's it actually come down a little bit to around 168 a litre for high octane. We unfortunately, when we were in the EU, we had to follow EU directives on metrication, and so pr petrol in Britain, uh, as we call it, is sold by the litre, not the gallon. Yes. Uh, yes I, I, something, I, something we need to sort out. I, I keep being reminded of uh, what was it David Irving always said, we are divided by a common language. Um, yes, I, I, <laughs> I quite America. like David. Uh, David Irving and I actually met once uh, a long time ago. Um, we have very different views, particularly about the Royal Navy. He was very unfair about a Royal Navy commander. Well, his father was in the Royal Navy, so... Yeah, he, he seemed to have a, a, he had a right go at a, a friend of a friend of mine, a friend of several friends, uh, who'd performed very well in the Battle of the Barents Sea. I, so I, I, certainly, he, he and I did not agree or see eye to eye, but he was very pleasant. I mean, he's, he, has some, he has some good arguments, and I, 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 do, I do enjoy his books, because they are well-researched. I will say that. I will definitely say that. Speaking uh, no, of no, no, I, 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 on so, on several things, he's right, and he doesn't. He does think for himself. But see, that's the wonderful thing about having a civilized discourse with two people who can disagree and have a well, conversation yeah. about it, which is one of the things we seem to be missing in the world today. Well, which exactly. is he's, he's an historian. I'm an historian, so. Yes, we we had we, we we had. I mean, I have to say, we had, we only met once, but we had a, a drink, and uh, it was it, it was perfectly pleasant. Um, and I, yes, civilized discourse is um, one way of is the best way of resolving matters. It, it's the best way of resolving intelligence disputes. Uh, Intelli or and intelligent intelligence disputes or intelligent disputes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there's nothing. There's nothing sillier than having someone dig their heels in and and abuse opponents. Um, sometimes, I, I some intelligence historians fall into that trap. I remember being abused roundly. I was a speaker at the intelligence conference at Gregunog. Now, that Gregunog is a beautiful Tudor hall in deepest Wales, which takes satellite navigation to find, or a very good map in my case. Um, beautiful hall. Uh, uh, lovely surroundings where they do a nice lunch and 
Uh, it's a residential intelligence conference. And uh, Christopher Andrew, the official historian of MI5, turned up and the official historian of GCHQ. It had been quite a few major players in intelligence rolled up to this conference back in 2013. And I was roundly abused. I mean, abused. And I mean, really, they had a right go at me when I was giving my presentation in questions right. uh, over my analysis in my book, Spy Hunter. Which I, I bought a, yes. I have a copy here today. There's my book, Spy Hunter. Yes, and I wanted to talk to you about it. I revealed that German U boats were operating from the Republic of Ireland in World War II. MI6 still hadn't grasped this. Uh, and I mean, I'm right. I mean, so first, firstly, it's it's completely the wrong way to deal with an intelligence historian is to is to not engage in civilized discourse and then and to round on him as a conspiracy theorist, which is silly. Um, but but you know, that's the sort of thing that Wikipedia might say. So there's no need to behave like you're a Wikipedia editor. Uh, and secondly, it, it, I am absolutely right. <laughs> I mean, I was in the west coast of Ireland last month uh, and talked to people who can recall meeting u-boat crews in pubs <laughs> u-boat crews are coming ashore they were going to pubs on the west coast of ireland the bloody u-boats were going in and out uh, at dusk and dawn but but people could see them <laughs> and mi6 just didn't pick it up we, we we never understood throughout the whole of world war ii we never understood that german u-boats were being based on the west coast of ireland i mean there's a large part of the irish that was very sympathetic with the german Ever since, ever since government, 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 ever. the prime minister, oh, yeah. so the, the Irish government were fully in the loop on this. But but the, it's an open secret on the west coast of Ireland. And once once locals knew that I knew that they weren't letting the cat out of the bag, they were quite happy to talk about. Oh, my grandfather you know, used to watch the U-boats go in and out, and the, the boys would come into the pub for a drink. Um, and obviously, any Englishman would would be booted out the door first uh, or shot. <laughs> uh, but it is an open secret on the west coast of Ireland, uh, and MI6 still hadn't grasped the truth as of 2013. But but has not the badge conspiracy theorist almost become one of honour now that well, we we know that the CIA came yes, up with I, I, I ought to take who... pride. Yeah, I ought to take pride in my Wikipedia page. Incidentally, if any of your viewers. Uh, I have read my page. Read my page on Wikipedia. It's a load of rubbish, uh, put together by a German operative called Psychonaut, who I can't sue because Wikipedia won't tell me who he is. He's a German asset. All I know is he's a white man with a beard who lives in England, uh, and I can't. I can't just issue a writ for libel against you know someone who's white and has a beard. Um, uh, I've got to be a bit, bit more specific than that. Just as a slightly. And I can't sue Wikipedia because of Section Two Hundred and Thirty, the Communications Decency Act, which means. Wikipedia can libel me all day long. That that uh, that page, which I reviewed recently, is full of the most tendentious nonsense. It accused me of being a, a member of the Socialist Workers Party. <laughs> yes, I remember. They're, they're trots. I mean, I am not. I have not, and never have been a trot. No, I look like uh, a trot. But when you read when you read that Wikipedia page, you do see is it full of contradictions, which makes it sort of easy to pick up that well, there's something wrong here. Uh, because... Well, yes, it has me. It has me as a member of four different political parties in about space of about two years, uh, and then and then standing for one for Parliament. Well, anybody who has a brain knows that parliamentary parties do background checks before they put someone. In. <laughs> before you stand for a political party, they do have to check you out. Uh, there's no way in the world I could have been a member of four different political parties in the space of two years. It, it, it's complete. A, a complete invention uh, attributed to a, an old political enemy of mine called Bill Rammel, who was, at the time he made the statement, the Foreign Office Minister in Tony Blair's government, a pro, a, a, a Remainer, um, and very anxious to uh, smear me as a lever. Okay. Now this this smear, which is about a quarter of a century old, uh, which anybody, you know, anybody could check their facts in five minutes, uh, this smear is still stuck on my Wikipedia page, and I can't do anything about it. But that's part of the problem. What uh, I was I was going to ask you in you know in three minutes of uh, or less, what's wrong with the world today, and what, how we can fix it? Um, oh. <laughs> but one of the one of the problems is that anything that is thrown out online, which is now a political yeah. tool, any accusation, well, the accusation stands as fact, because yeah. you never get half the time. You can't go to court. We've all had things said about us. 
and somewhere down the line we we can then issue all our we're back to when did you stop beating well, your we, wife we, we, we need to repeal section 230 make wikipedia liable for libel li liable for libel or defamation uh and it's also a nonsense people don't understand german intelligence monitor my wikipedia page nobody can get to it uh it's correction a, a factual correction to a lie on wikipedia my wikipedia entry will last about five minutes before it's removed i can't edit my entry because i they denied me editing privileges anyone who edits edits it to put the truth in gets the editorial privileges revoked uh, so it's under very tight german control and and the the, pe the people who have composed this attack piece get email notifications as soon as any edit is made so they are told uh, and within minutes they're on wikipedia uh restoring uh the smears so it, it's not it's not possible to correct smears on wikipedia if you're the subject of german intelligence interest which i am well they don't make it very uh, easy I, I was asked when i tried to uh, have a wikipedia page uh, they're trying to who i was to make statements about me uh mm. <laughs> it's like how dare i um but before we get to what's wrong with the rest of the world uh, tell me about your book because i'm still waiting on my copy showing up in the mail which is run which put uh, through german intelligence and whitehall into shock when it was published in 2014. um the book was the subject of a very determined attempt by the cabinet office and thames valley police to suppress it I am the only modern British author that's been subject to pre-publication censorship by the British government to the extent of having my book seized and my backup copies. Um, the, the Thames Valley Police claimed that they wanted to seize, they seized my computer, they seized all my working copies, they seized my backups, and uh, which are on memory sticks, for example. So they seized all the backups, uh, uh, all my working papers, and claimed it was for evidence. Uh, at the trial, which took place in front of a corrupt judge, uh, now dead, uh, Judge McCreth. Uh, was, I say corrupt, he had a mistress and he was being blackmailed. Um, uh, it was odd, actually. Moss, Mossad, Mossad uh, with whom I have a good relationship, uh, uh, very nice people, Mossad had found out about the mistress by having a look at his telephones. Uh, obviously, they were tapping his telephones. The Germans were tapping his phones. Uh, GCHQ were tapping his phones. Uh, Mossad had a look at him and found out about the mistress. Uh, he was talking to the mistress on the mistress's mobile phone from his mobile phone, so his wife wouldn't find out. Um, he couldn't afford a divorce. Uh, and he was then lent on. Uh, but Judge McCreth was d d very determined and clearly was acting under orders not to allow the jury to see the book. I actually rolled up with six copies of the book for the jury. And, uh, and the prosecution having so the prosecution seized the book or the police seized the book saying we need this as evidence of an offence. They never said what offence. There is no there's, there's no law against telling the truth, even in England. Uh, 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 the idea that you, as an historian, can commit a criminal offence by writing the truth uh, in an intelligence history is just farcical. Uh, but having seized the book as evidence, in inverted commas, they then desperately tried and successfully tried, succeeded, in fact, uh, in blocking the book from reaching the jury. <laughs> uh, I was barely allowed to mention it. I was certain, I, I was certainly the jury never saw their copies. Um, it was quite funny. What they overlooked, of course, was the fact that I, knowing that the book was explosive and that it contained major revelations about the top German spies in the United States and Britain in World War II, uh, revelations about the cabinet office, uh, post-war cabinet secretaries working for German intelligence, uh, the truth about Madeleine McCann, the kidnap of Madeleine McCann, the the my paper for the Joint Intelligence Committee on Madeleine McCann, requested by a former deputy chairman was an acting chairman was in the the redacted version of that in the in the appendix uh, or one of the appendices and i told the truth about the comets i told the truth about Aberfan, where the germans murdered uh, over 150 welsh school children yeah. uh, the cabinet office were absolutely desperate to suppress publication so were german intelligence and I suspected that there might be an attempt to suppress publication in Britain. 
uh, obviously knew the cabinet office were corrupt. I knew the then cabinet secretary, uh, uh, Jeremy Hayward, was a German spy. And uh, I had backed the book up, not just in Britain, where the backups were vulnerable to seizure, uh, by the state, but I backed the book up in South Africa, Australia, Canada. <laughs> it's backed up in the United States, Canada, South Africa, Australia. It's it still for sale and it can still be found. Oh, yes. The only problem was that the backups were in PDF. And I, I'm not an IT specialist. What I know about IT wouldn't fill the back of a postage stamp, uh, even the small ones they give you these days. I, so I, and I do rely on other people for IT. And I it was told when I converted the chapters into PDF that this would be absolutely fine. And if I needed to convert them back into Word, that would be straightforward. That, well, it is now, actually. It is now, now, yeah. Now it's easy. Then it was most certainly wasn't straightforward. <laughs> they had to be reduced into plain text. And I, oh, uh -huh. dear. The, the, it, it was... It, took several months to get the conversion firstly to work out how to do it and then uh, then to actually do it and it was all done all the chapters were backed up each chapter had a pdf file the book was too big to go in a single pdf file so each chapter was in a pdf file each appendix was in a pdf file uh the introduction the contents the glossary there, there were a whole bunch of separate pdf files all of them had to be converted laboriously back into where it held it up for about three months and then the American, the original publishers were American, so I wrote the book in American. Uh, <laughs> and not in English, but in American. Then it was shifted to England, and the English publisher said, the June Press were nice people. June Press said, oh, did Michael, it's an American. I said, well, yes. That, that's because it was going to be published by the United States Naval Institute Press, who had originally published Tom Clancy's book, Red October. Yeah. And they were Tom Clancy's publishers. In fact, Tom Clancy was murdered in order to stop him meeting me, uh, which was a great shame, a re really great shame. Should, shouldn't have been murdered in the first place. Uh, uh, he, he and I had not, in fact, agreed to meet. But uh, it just so happened I was flying into Annapolis for a conference at the United States Naval Institute where I met uh, uh, Jim Lovell, the commander of Apollo 13, whose spacecraft was sabotaged by the Germans. And there was some real anxiety in Germany that Tom, Tom Clancy and Michael were going to meet. Tom was getting stuff from a mutual friend, you see. There was a, Tom had a, a, a condo at a hotel called the Greenbrier in West Virginia, which is a very nice hotel. Um, yes, and, yes, a nice place. Which was the seat, the alternative seat of US government in the event of a nuclear war. Yes. So there are facilities there for, for Congress to sit. And Tom had a condo there. And uh, the, the, what the bad guys didn't realize was that uh, one of the neighboring condos belonged to a mutual friend so it, stuff was uh, stuff was being fed by my mutual friend tom and i had never met never spoke but uh, ideas were being fed to tom via the mutual friend and all of a sudden i was then driving a bentley owned a bentley turbo and all of a sudden tom clancy had the head of british intelligence running around in the bentley it, it was quite funny and uh, various ideas of mine found their way into his book. So it was assumed that he and I were in direct communication. And when I flew into Annapolis in 2013, uh, he, he was murdered. The, 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 I, I, he was murdered a few hours before I, my plane touched down at um, Baltimore, Washington International. What did a, happen? A tragedy. A tragedy, a totally unfair, totally tra very unfair on Tom. Well, uh, most of being murdered would think so, yes. Um, well, it's not nice to be murdered in the first place. Uh, yeah, it's not annoying. It's very upsetting to be murdered. Um, uh, he should never be murdered, but that, that is why he was murdered, uh, to stop a meeting between him and me. Mm. And, of course, he had his own connections. He had a range of... Uh, uh, Hunt for yeah. Red was quite well yeah, informed. Yeah, yeah. He had a range of connections, including with the Office of Naval Intelligence. So uh, uh, Tom was not just... He was a well-informed novel. He, he was. He he was. He he had some very interesting connections. Uh, he, he he did. Um, uh, people got confused because some of his connections were of comparatively low rank, but that that's always a mistake. It's the same mistake people make about Adolf Hitler in World War One. Um, his yeah. official rank was only a corporal, but he in fact was, as we discussed last time, was an intelligence officer. Um, 
And Tom Clancy, for example, uh, one of his major sources was, I think, a chief petty officer. But the chief petty officer in intelligence is actually quite a, quite quite well connected, quite well informed. I must never look down on chief petty officers or non commissioned officers. No, it, it was the, it very was the, well informed, very experienced, very yeah. well informed, and highly trusted. Um, and an admiral might communicate, admirals might communicate a message via a chief petty officer that he wouldn't trust to an ensign. I mean, it was the middle ranking that got the Russians their space program. Of uh, they got all the middle of the Germans. Yes. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's there's a lot more to that. Um, so, but you got the book published. You, you, how did how did yeah, you get? We got it published in twenty. We eventually got it published. It was translated back from American into English, and we we got it published in twenty fourteen. Incidentally, if any of your readers want to buy a copy, the publishers June Press will not send it directly to the states because of the sheer cost of postage. Yeah, um, they, the publishers have sent me. I actually have a small stock of the book, uh, and I can now take credit cards. Um, uh, so I can, I if anybody wants to email me at michael at mshrimpton.co.uk, I can sell you a copy of the book. Unfortunately, the, the, the publishers are right, the, the costs of I know sending it to the, the it, it's a heavy book, it weighs it weighs uh two and a quarter pounds. And it postage and packing is thirty pounds. There's nothing to do about that. It's about twenty eight pounds of postage, and I have to wrap it in a padded that's bag. I don't. I'm not making any profit on the thirty pound P and P. I'm afraid. On the other hand, of course, the good news is that the, the uh, thanks to the cabinet office and the Bank of England, uh, the pound has tanked. So uh, <laughs> it, it's it's the, the cost of the book has come down. Well, have you thought about a digital publication? Much as I, well, I, I tried that, I I invested high hopes. Um, although I'm not Kindle literate, I am technically aware, and uh, I had high hopes of the Kindle edition, price, precisely because of the cost of postage. I thought, yes. Kindle, I thought the Kindle version would go down really well. So yeah, we had a Kindle version, and I think we sold. I, I think sales of on Kindle were sort of one book a quarter. Hmm. Yeah, the, the, the publishers said, "Look, Michael, it's it's not worth it. The 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 admin required for Kindle, and processing the payments and so on is it, not we're, we're not covering our costs. The sales on Kindle were risibly low. They they really were extraordinarily low. Yeah. Um, um, it, I had the same I thing. With we concluded that uh, apart from the fact that the target audience didn't really use Kindle, um, yeah. we concluded that the book was probably too large for Kindle." Uh, I, I hadn't realized it's about 700 pages in print and I think the Kindle version turned out to be a thousand pages and we 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 yeah we 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 kind of uh, we kind of settled on the idea that it was too large a book uh, for Kindle but but whether that's right or whether that's right I don't know but all I can tell you is that we did try Kindle very hard and it was on Kindle for several years and I, I, in, in the space of I don't know two or three years uh, the sales on Kindle were probably half a dozen books. So it, it, it may be also... Be it was a total waste of time. We, we, yeah. we were better off not doing it. But if you look at people like uh, like, like you and I and, and all yeah. the people who are watching, they're historians. We like books. We like a physical book. We can make annotations. That's can... right. I, I, I was surprised. I, I thought the younger... Uh, I like now, so I'm, like, I'm with you. I like books. I've got you know, yeah. there's my library behind me. Yeah. I much prefer uh, books that are proper books, not electronic books. Uh, yeah. I, I thought younger readers uh, would be more attuned to Kindle. They're more used to it, and uh, you can take Kindle with you on holiday and read. But of course, it wasn't a holiday book. Uh, Kindle seems to work best on holidays because you can take about you know you can take ten or twenty books on Kindle. And but that's also the problem with the young generation we're looking at now. They haven't. There's a stage in every everyone's evolution where you have different interests and you start to mature into topics such as history and conspiracies yeah. and, and things that are happening. And the generation that are the young generation, the teenagers running around with Kindle, are not going to get. They're not there yet. No, I no, no that's, that's true. Sure, uh, I, I don't know what the age profile is of the readership of Spy Hunter. I mean, Spy, I mean, although the Kindle sales were disappointingly low, the book is, has never been out of print. Uh, in fact, the publishers have just done another reprint. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't sold well, but it's sold. Having said that, it, 
it hasn't. It, it, certainly, the sales are, are very low in comparison to the sales of uh, you know, a pot boiler. Um, yeah. If it was a popular history, if I were a popular historian, which I'm not, I'm an intelligence historian, so I tell the truth. Um, if I was a popular historian, I just turned out turned out the usual rubbish. Um, it would have sold tens of thousands. Um, yeah. I, by the standard for a 700 page textbook, sales are probably over a thousand. Then, then it, it hasn't done too badly. Well, it's good, but I, I had the this- very influential behind the scenes. Every, every, virtually every intelligence agency in the world, except possibly the Peruvians, has a copy of Spy Hunter in their intelligence library. So, uh, all intelligence agencies have libraries. Uh, I remember visiting Israeli military intelligence once, and they, the boys, were very polite and very switched on, and they made sure that a a journal in which, that had just published an article of mine, published by a dear man called Harvey Feldman. CIA uh, ambassador fell the lovely, lovely man, and uh, he was the editor of Journal of International Security Affairs. And an article of mine on Iraq and Afghanistan was in the latest edition, and they had they they had it on the on the rack at the front of the library. I thought, well done. So the group I was with said, "Oh, there's an article by Michael in this in this journal." Uh, outstanding. I don't know what you did with the Peruvians, but. but uh... <laughs> well, I might. Well, uh, well, I, I, I pissed off a, Peru, a gay Peruvian intelligence officer. Uh, uh, it was slightly odd, actually. Uh, he was keen on me and I was quite keen on him. He was quite a nice Peruvian intelligence officer. But he, he we had a bust up over, over over the non-election of uh, a non-election of um, Joe Biden in 2020. Oh. He was totally, totally convinced, totally convinced that Joe Biden actually won the election. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, and we had a bet, uh, uh, and in fact, I put a bit of money on on Donald Trump, knowing he was going to win. And then, then of course, there was the fraud. I refused to pay because because I don't pay out on a fraud. I said, "Well, hang on, this uh, the bet was on the basis that this election, the votes would be actually fairly counted. Uh, Donald Trump has won the election, so I haven't lost the bet. I, I bet he would win the election. Well, he has. Uh, he just hasn't been declared the president because the votes have not been fairly counted." So we had we had a bit of a bust up over that. Uh, he was, I suppose you could say my contact with Peruvian intelligence. Um, uh, so perhaps the Peruvians pulled my book. I, I don't know, but it may well be there is a copy of a Spy Hunter in the in 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 the library in Lima. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to have to recount that story to some of the uh, people. I, I know some of the lawyers in, in, uh, in Mr. Trump's old cabinet. I'm going to have to recount that. And oh, do, do. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, there's no doubt that Donald Trump won the 2020 election. The, the, uh, uh, there was a coup in practice, and it was organized by the Career Group. It was organized from Frankfurt. So the stories about servers and uh, so on in Frankfurt are all true. I mean, the Dominion voting machines and other voting machines are being tampered with. I suspect the Brazilian election result is also going to be rigged uh, because the DVD do not want um, uh, 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 the Brazilian president to be re-elected. What about the German results? I mean, we all we all we all thought that elections in the Western civilized world were high standards and and honest. And what well, it was, yeah. uh, before twenty, you're right. Before 2020, we, we assumed that elections uh, were fairly conducted. In fact, they haven't been. In 1975, the British Cabinet Office, the Cabinet Secretary of the day, John Hunt, was a paedophile, and he rigged the election. He rigged the referendum on membership of the EU. So, in, in a high stakes election, in practice, they were rigged in favour by German intelligence in favour of the German position. So the British people weren't allowed to vote in 75 fairly. Uh, they voted, they're allowed to vote, uh, but the votes weren't counted fairly. Uh, the American people in 2020 were allowed to vote. The problem wasn't the problem wasn't stopping them going to the polls. The problem was uh, that their votes were not being counted properly. Uh, and uh, the, the Germans have slightly shot themselves in the foot because they've undermined respect for democracy. They've undermined respect for election results. And yes. they may now find a problem. There could be a military coup in Brazil because they've used or they are using. We're in the middle of the election at the moment. We're going through to the second round next weekend um, because they're using electronic voting machines and because confidence in these voting machines has collapsed completely. As it should. Uh, if the result goes against the president, uh, Bolsonaro, then they're. they're 
uh, that he may not accept the result and he may be right yes and then, and then the, the, the the then the question comes well uh, if the election is a joke if it's a complete fraud uh how do we go about uh, reflecting the will of the people the will of the will of the brazilian people may best be reflected by a military coup sadly yes, but and that's one of the things on, I... the, on the other hand it's just possible that the brazilian it's just possible that the germans have uh, uh, frightened by the row over 2020 have backed off uh, and aren't haven't tampered with the results it's just possible that uh the, the left-wing opponent louis might win fairly and there might not be tampering but but everybody thinks there will be because of 2020. Uh, you, electronic voting machines need to be abandoned the use of electronic yep. machines should be abandoned full stop doesn't matter how secure they are uh, uh people have lost trust and confidence in them we need to have to just like when the americans supervised the uh, elections in iraq have everybody come in and dip their thumb in uh, in purple dye so they can only vote once yes um, and, but but I think that this is part of the bigger problem. And if you look at elections alone, if you cheat every time, sooner or later someone will catch you. But if you only cheat at the key junctures, so now we may see an honest election, but the next time when it really matters. And I think yeah. you're absolutely right. Well, what we now have, we have a problem in, in the world today, and certainly in, in the Western world. And yeah. I don't know, as a historian with a background in, in psychology, I'm looking at what's going on. I'm looking at people's reactions from trying to take a step back and look at all the details and individual skirmishes. Mm -hmm. But I'm seeing, I, I, I no longer see, and this is certainly not an, an encouragement, but I'm afraid I don't see a peaceful solution to where they have placed us because they have well, taken the world in a direction. There may not be a peaceful solution. The, uh, you're right. Uh, uh, the G German intelligence uh, tend to be careful. It, this, the cabinet office, the cabinet secretary was a German spy, of course, the, in, in 1975. It usually is a German spy in the cabinet office. Um, the, the cabinet secretary was a German spy, wanted to keep Britain under the German thumb inside mm. the EEC, as it then was. So he wanted Britain to be a German client state because he was working for the Germans. He was a scumbag, no offence intended, and a paedophile. And murder as well. He's certainly guilty as an accessory after the fact to a number of murders of teenage boys. So he's someone who really ought to be in jail, but ought to be hanged, really. Um, the, except we'd abolished hanging by 75 in order to encourage murder. It was a very successful policy, too. The murder rate shot up. Now, uh, John Hunt rigged the 75 referendum, which was a, a, an issue of vital importance for Germany, because the Germans are desperate to keep Britain. They knew that the EC membership yeah. was threatening the British economy. Indeed, we had to crawl to the IMF the following year. Uh, the Germans were desperate to, to wreck the British economy and keep Britain under the German thumb. And the election was too, the referendum was regarded as too important to be allowed to be held fairly. So the cabinet office rigged the results. They did it by having regional counting and by not adding the numbers up correctly. Uh, there were, the police were also instructed to offload ballot papers from areas thought to vote against membership of the EEC. Uh, there was a lot of a diversion of ballot boxes. Um, what what they did was they well they, did, they had two methods of rigging it. The first method, the most important, was to have regional counting, um, uh, uh, so uh, and not declare the results in each individual constituency, and that allowed them to tally the numbers. So the problem wasn't so much with the voting; it, it was with the tallying. So mm -hmm. the actual votes were being accurately recorded by individual returning officers, but when they were tallied, uh, the 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 tallies were tampered with so that you ended up with a yes result um the and the other was to look at areas of the country like the west country uh cornwall and so on where it was thought there would be a large no majority or a large majority voting to leave the eec yeah. and there they just removed whole ballot boxes so ba ballot ba ballots were cast yeah um, and then people are allowed to put the their ballot in the ballot box, but the ballot box was then removed by the police. Um, they, they were stored, to, you know, taken to disused airfields, for example, and stored in a hangar. I don't know how long they kept the ballots for. They simply weren't counted at all. Now, obviously, if you take a whole ballot box, there are going to be some idiots who voted yes 
uh, you know, there'll be some yes votes, but the, the calculation was this area is likely to vote no, so we they just won't get a vote. We'll just remove the ballot boxes from that area. Yes. Um, yes. But, of course, as with the 2020 election, where you tamper with results, um, so, you know, it, 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 you're, you're, the, the result is dishonest and it misleads people. Uh, the, the rest of the world thought that membership of the EC was popular because the British people had voted by a, a seemingly large majority to stay in the EEC. Even the Europeans thought, you know, people who weren't in the loop on the tampering with the result, thought that Britain had voted to stay inside the EC. So the Europeans, Brussels, the European Commission, actually thought that membership was popular. And then when Brexit came along, people were shocked. <laughs> but they, they had absolutely no idea. Uh, you know, they, they thought, uh, apparently, people weren't expecting the result. But I they thought, must have known, remember, when they, when they were put out the vote of the who wanted to join the monetary union, the Germans weren't even asked because the polling, polling amongst the German people said they did not want to get rid of the Deutschmarks. No, and it, I have never yet met anyone in the EU who really wants to be in the EU. Unless they're a European Commission. You have to excuse me. Of course. I mean, let, let's face it, half of the people in Europe, they work for the European Union. Uh, <laughs> well, with the thousands of commissars that are that are hired, not elected. Yeah, I, I'm, and, I'm afraid that I was in London for the Queen's funeral and there were two million people in London and there were a lot of, a lot of them had colds and I picked up a heavy cold while I was up there, <clears throat> which I'm only just recovering from. As long as it's a cold, not uh, COVID point seven. No, I tested it. I thought it might be COVID. I, I had my booster jab last week, and I thought, oh, Lord, I better do a test just to make sure I haven't got COVID. I don't you have do. COVID. Um, uh, but uh, but I, it's, certainly it's, had a, I certainly had a very heavy cold. Well, it is getting you cold out there, is it? Well, it, 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 the, the trouble with heavy colds, it was costing me sleep. So I had about 10, in 10 interrupted nights sleep on a row. The result, uh, exhaustion. <laughs> That'll, that will do it. Yeah, getting getting over it now, but but it, it, it knocked me back for it slowed me up for about a fortnight. I will do that. Now, one thing I I, tr I did a wrote of written a few white papers in my life that yep. is not important, but one of the things I try to impress on our uh, dear Americans is that there is a red thread that leads from World War II to the post World War II to yep. the EEC to the EU to yes. various events here that lead straight into a conflict with American politics today. And right. the influence of this post-World War II generation that created the EU and the EU's influence on American politics, it all ties together right. under some of these globalists yeah. that right. have their agenda. Um, I would love right. to hear your take the on EU, that. That the, be the problem. The EU, the, the, the idea of the EU was dreamt up by... Uh, Reich Minister Funk, uh, who was the Reich Minister for Economic Affairs, and the the blueprint for the EEC as it became was dropped. Well, it was actually called the EEC then, the Europäische Wirtschaft Gemeinschaft in German. Uh, apologies, ich spreche nicht Deutsch. So if you're German and you're listening, the, the, the apologies for my German. It's not very good. Um, so the Europäische Wirtschaft Gemeinschaft or European Economic Community, that that concept for that was formulated between about 1939 and early 41 by a team of officials in the Reich Ministry of Economic Affairs. Now, the whole concept of the EC was to allow Germany to dominate Europe without keeping large occupation forces in place. Uh, the reasons for that are occupation armies are expensive, uh, not just in terms of cost, but also in terms of manpower. Uh, the Germans did not want to maintain large armies of occupation in Western Europe. So Canaris and Funk uh, came up with the bright idea. So we don't need to maintain occupation armies if we can have puppet governments. Um, and we have an EEC. So the, the German German economy will dominate Europe. So we make, basically we make the whole of Europe. Britain was going to be an agricultural provider, for example, um, with and deindustrialized, which happened after we joined yeah, the EEC. Yeah. Um, we, the, the idea was to have Germany in control of Europe, but not having to maintain the, the Wehrmacht, uh, and not having to execute hostages and uh, do all the thing, you know, the, 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 all, all the torture, the firing squads, all the usual things you associate with 
a German occupation. Because the Germans aren't very nice, no offense intended. Uh, <laughs> individual Germans maybe, I've met some nice Germans, I met half a dozen nice Germans in my life, and I'm sure there are more, but um, the, the Germans, the German, Germany as a whole is not very nice, and if, if you're being occupied by the Germans, then you can expect gang rapes and nuns to be, uh, you know, ba babies to be bayoneted and nuns to be gang raped and people to be shot and herded into churches and set fire to, that actually happened in France, they, they, the bastards stuck with hundreds of women, children, and men in a in a church and set fire to it. Um, that sort of thing. The the idea was not to have that uh, because it was thought to be cheaper to have the EEC. Uh, because we didn't shut down German intelligence in 1945, because Admiral Canaris, uh, you know, kept the show on the road. Uh, the concept for German domination of Europe uh, came back. It never, whatever, went away. And the Germans pursued firstly the Council of Europe and the European Court of Human Rights, which was always under German control. And the judges were blackmailed and so on. And if they weren't blackmailed, they were bribed. Um, and in the idea there being to undermine border control and make sure states couldn't effectively run themselves. So the, the idea of the European Convention on Human Rights was to undermine state sovereignty, being very effective. Rule by bureaucracy. Rule by bureaucracy. And then. And then we had the EC. The EC came along on the 1st of January 57, uh, 1st of January 58, rather, thanks to the Treaty of Rome 57. Under um, Hausstein. Yeah. Now, the, yeah, the, Hausstein was involved with Himmler during the Second World War, again, in the creation of how to manage Europe under German control. Yes, although the primary, say, the primary impetus came not from Himmler, but from Canaris and from Funk, Hitler. Uh, how much Hitler knew about what was being planned in the Reich Ministry of Economic Affairs, uh, nobody knows. Uh, he may have known something about the plan. Uh, I doubt he was fully in the loop because Canaris tried to keep Hitler in the dark. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he treated him like a mushroom, a bit like the way the cabinet secretary treats the prime minister. Uh, uh, keep <laughs> her in the dark. Uh, feed, feed her shit and keep her in the dark. Uh, the... So the EC was set up essentially according to the original blueprint. The only the only major difference to the 39 plan that they added, the only difference between the EC as it became and the Fog plan was they added in a parliament. So they added in an assembly in Strasbourg um, uh, just to give it a veneer of legitimacy. Um, but the assembly was modelled on the Reichstag uh, in the Nazi era. So it was... Uh, it, it was an assembly that gave the appearance of democracy, but in practice was toothless. And it's interesting. It's still, it's still going. I mean, the, the European Parliament is still completely toothless, uh, but it gives a veneer of democracy and a veneer of democratic legitimacy to the whole EU idea. But it was modeled on the Reichstag and it behaves like the Reichstag. But so that's what, when, when we say it's toothless because it doesn't have an army, and I'm seeing a certain political... Oh, no, the, the European Parliament is too. The EU is not toothless because it's got bureaucrats. It does appear. Bureaucrats, exactly can be very, bureaucrats can be very dangerous. The, the EU relied on control through regulations. So the EU would strangle the British economy by regulations that we applied stupidly, uh, but, but weren't actually applied in Europe in many cases. See, that's a, that's a, that is what is happening now. And this is where you yes, can... See the federal government works along much the same lines. You have... Exactly. And you, you have... And when you see... You can you can rule... You don't need an army. You don't need a police oh, force. Great. You need an IRS. You need a tax force. You need yes. bureaucrats that can dominate and control each and individual little well, line. The federal, the federal bureaucracy reports to the DVD. Uh, that, that's, why, that's why the American Constitution, which Americans love, uh, the American Constitution was overthrown in 2020 uh, by German intelligence, but they needed bureaucratic assets in order to... Uh, it wasn't just a question of tampering with voting machines. They needed assets on the Supreme Court. They needed assets uh, in Washington to make the whole thing stick. So the, the US Constitution was... The Germans detest the idea of democracy. Germany's totally opposed to democracy. And the 2020 election was a joke. Uh, it's turned into a joke by German intelligence. Um, but the uh, you're right, the bureaucratic assets in Washington were an essential part of that process. And uh, that is sort of, sort of what we, what happened in Europe has sort of been a testbed for what uh, certain people in America is trying to yeah. turn America into. 
is and then you i always said and 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 no offense to anyone but european politicians are generally quite smart in the way they do things because they they're, they not, don't, they're, they're, they're not as they're not as stupid as our politicians yes i'd accept that or, or ours or american they, politicians. american well which is a whole new ball game they don't telegraph what they're going to do it okay. just it just happens in the middle of the night you wake up next morning in europe no, over the past yes. few oh, yeah, years european, the, the european politicians don't believe in uh, uh don't believe in democracy they certainly no, don't no, no, at all, at all. you I wake up so, and you you know, discussed, you know, i i referred to canaris we discussed canaris last time mm. uh i've looked out for this evening i looked out all this art this morning i looked out the photographs now it's not it's not very good because i i'm uh, at the same time trying to look at the camera uh -huh. well. uh, now what we have there is a, a, a wartime photograph of canaris and a post-war photograph the photograph on the left was a wartime photograph the photograph on the right uh, uh you see the photograph on my left was taken during the war the photograph on the right with the dogs was taken in the late 1950s, possibly as late as 1960. Yeah. And the dogs aren't his, his favorite dogs, which are not Dachshunds, which they were during the war. Uh, and by facial recognition technology, by tomog facial tomography, you can, you can verify from the length of the earlobes that th there's a huge gap. You can't yeah. discuss, we discussed last time, you can't narrow it down to, a, you know, a, 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 a few days or weeks or even months, but you can certainly narrow it down to a year or two. Um, the, the photograph, the man on the right is about 15 years later than the man on the left. But yeah. the, man, the man on the, the Canaris is supposed to have been executed in 1945. <laughs> and, well, and, and, and the whole, the, the, the fact that Canaris was not executed is the single most central but, but probably the single most important fact of the 20th century, uh, because Canaris exercised enormous influence post-war through yes. the DVD. So it was Canaris who decided that President Kennedy had to be shot uh, because uh, the, uh, Kennedy uh, removed the German spy Alan Foster Dulles. Sorry, Alan Welsh Dulles. The, his, Foster was the brother. Uh, yeah. The, they, the German spy Alan Welsh Dulles, who reported to Canaris, was removed as head of the CIA. That threatened, German, it, it brought to an end German control of the CIA. And what's more, John McCone threatened to roll up the German network inside CIA, including Richard Helms. So Canaris decided that Kennedy had to go. So he did. And what Canaris decided normally, not always, but normally happened. He he didn't get his way on the EEC for some years. He wanted Britain in at the beginning, but we had a good prime minister called Anthony Eden, who wasn't terrible, yeah. was very decent. Uh, his instinct was to keep us out of the EEC, and he did. So we, we, owe, we owe that much to Anthony Eden. Uh, he, of course, was then undermined uh, partly by John Foster Dulles over Suez and yeah. by a German spy called Harry McMillan, who took over from him as prime minister. Uh, but Eden... Uh, Eden kept us out of the EC at the beginning, and then we had the goods. What, the, what Canaris didn't realize was that we had, because there were people in Britain, including Brian English, who understood that, and met Canaris post war, uh, who understood that Canaris was in charge of the show in Germany. Um, we had the goods on General de Gaulle. We knew that he was gay, we knew that he was a lover of Marshal Patan, and that he was a protege, indeed, of Patan before World War II. Now, that was quite explosive for uh, de Gaulle to have been exposed as gay in 1960s France yes, yes. and as a protege of the Vichyist Patan would have been rather damaging for him personally and for his party. So the Rapprochement pour la République was the RPR, was it de Gaulle's party, was it not, from memory? Uh, mm -hmm. Je ne parle pas le français. My French is uh, pretty woeful. <laughs> my apologies to any French listeners for my French pronunciation or mispronunciation. Uh, or piss pronunciation, as uh, Ronnie Barker said on uh, on the two Ronnies once, a very famous uh, and very funny British TV show in the nineteen seventies. Uh, the it was so popular it had to be cancelled. Um, the the BBC only cancelled shows if they were popular. If the shows were not popular, they were kept on for decades. Uh, any unpopular show, any popular show tended to be cancelled. Uh, so Canaris 
I say, Canaris uh, uh, really uh, ran the show, but, but, but didn't always succeed. And because we had the goods on de Gaulle, we were able to persuade him, i.e. Black Bell. Yes. Well, not Black Bell, because we really call it Black Bell if the Germans do it. If we do it, it's called uh, persuasion. Persuasion. Yeah. Uh, uh, we were able to have a quiet word. If we do it, it's called having a quiet word. We had a quiet word with de Gaulle, and de Gaulle uh, vetoed the applications made by uh, Harold Macmillan, who was a German spy, and then his successor, uh, but one, uh, Harold Wilson, who was also a German spy. In between, you had an old friend of mine called that, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, a nice chap, who didn't want to, really didn't want to go into the EZ. So now we are looking at a system that is so embedded and so ingrained between Ooh. the bureaucracy, the media, uh, an agenda that is, shall we say, absolutely not democratic, uh, democratic <laughs> on, a, on a world stage. And now we have put it under the emergency umbrella of uh, all their various green deals that will now freeze and starve people. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the global warming scam is, is you know, that, that is the Goebbels big lie propaganda technique uh, no reasoned critique of global anthropogenic global warming hypothesis as i call it uh, is permitted in the mainstream media now this is the, the the dvd the german the goebbels propaganda ministry the reich ministry of propaganda and enlightenment uh wasn't disbanded at the end of world war ii it just went underground and yes. Uh, it became the propaganda section of the DVD. Now, that's still in business. Uh, it's very powerful, very large, and uh, it has all sorts of links to newspaper owners. Um, the newspaper owners are allowed to trade offshore. They generate huge profits offshore tax-free through high-yield programs. Uh, and uh, in practice, the Germans, well, the Germans do, in fact, control the offshore trading programs. So they're able to dictate to anyone who's got uh, a reasonable amount of wealth most 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 people with large you know most billionaires are involved in high yield trading something i discovered when i was yeah. leading the bid to save rolls royce and uh, the germans can easily lean on them by denying them access to the programs yeah. so uh, given german access to newspaper proprietors uh, tv network proprietors etc 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 it's not difficult for the germans to suppress rational discussion about global warming even prime minister liz truss in britain who's actually quite smart even though she's an mp she's not stupid um liz truss even in a conference speech today in birmingham which is a very good speech by the way interrupted by a bunch of loons from greenpeace um My, the, she, she is still going down with this down the global warming path and is actually going to turn up to the cop 27 summit total waste of time mankind is not affecting the climate the climate is affected by the sun which for the benefit of any global warmest listening is a big that big yellow thing that you see in the sky uh that that is the largest single influence on planetary climate and we're going we're going through a period or have entered a period of reduced solar activity and we may we may we may be entering what is called a solar minimum uh which might see another 50 60 years of cooler temperatures so what we really need is more fossil fuels to actually heat our homes and not die well ah now not necessarily uh, i'm a big enthusiast for nuclear um yes uh, there are i mean <clears throat> well there are several arguments about fossil fuels firstly they don't come from fossils so, some <laughs> um uh, uh, i picked up this point a long time ago uh i was in moscow for a conference where President Putin was supposed to address, and then I think the Germans organized an earthquake in Siberia to keep him away from me. Um, the, I'm serious. I mean, there was an earthquake. It was probably triggered by a German earthquake weapon because we know they, uh, they've just done, well, they've just stiffed the boys in Florida. If, Dosa, if Governor DeSantis is listening to this, I'm afraid, mate, you've just been, you've had your state rolled over by the Jerrys uh, because they boosted Hurricane Ian um, because they're pissed off with you because they don't want you to run in 24 or be John Donald Trump's running mate which that's very like. interesting Joseph was talking about uh weaponization of weather as well so yes, I, he's right. different sides I mean, again we, we've never met um uh, but uh I, I believe in civilized discourse I, I I think he 
he and I don't agree on a number of things, but we do agree on weather weapons. So if he's saying that, then that he's absolutely right. The Germans weaponized weather and they did so years ago. I wish the Russians would go public on the station they seized in the Ukraine, because one of the ground stations is based near Chernobyl, which is why it's there, because the nuclear plant was built to provide the power for this uh, for these radio transmitters. They do it by means of electromagnetic energy, which is boosted into the upper atmosphere. The NSA uh, developed blocking mechanisms, but I don't think the NSA were permitted to stop Ian. If I were in the NSA shoes, if if uh, uh, if I were uh, uh, General Nakasone, I would go public on this and leak it to a newspaper, um, uh, because I don't think the American intelligence community can really stand by for for much longer and watch American lives being destroyed, uh, American homes being destroyed, uh, people's yachts being ending up on the on i-95 yeah. uh etc 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 it's just a nonsense and i and perhaps ian will see it well I probably won't uh, there's almost no limit to the ability of the intelligence community to tolerate disasters um the intelligence committee will probably allow the germans to carry on killing americans um but uh, oddly enough uh, for this particular hurricane i heard one commentator on sky i think say, why does this keep happening to America? Somebody has finally worked out that it, it, it's slightly unusual that, that all these hurricanes seem to end up on America. They, 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 they didn't seem to do the same amount of damage to Cuba. They did some, Ian did some damage to Cuba, but uh, how is it? <coughs> and and it also seems to be Republican states or there's a Republican administration which the Germans are unhappy with, like George W. Bush and Katrina, which was a boosted storm. So how does a weather, how does a storm know how to target Florida uh, uh, and, and why should it make any difference? If you're a hurricane, well, first, if you're a hurricane, you, you're not a sentient being. You don't have a consciousness. Uh, hurricanes can't decide, oh, we're going to attack Florida because the governor of Florida is DeSantis, DeSantis and he's a Republican and he's a supporter of Trump. Um, that's, you know, hurricanes don't choose to attack states because they've got Republican governors. So, so wake up, people. I mean, you know, the, the storms are being boosted. Hurricane Ian was not a naturally occurring phenomenon. It started as a naturally occurring phenomenon, but it only started as a little storm and then it's boosted and its direction is changed. The, the, you can change, the, the weather weapons are able to boost storms and they're able to change their direction. They can't create a storm out of nothing, that they can take an existing storm, they can boost it. So the Germans saw Ian, which was uh, started out as a small little category one or whatever, and they said, oh, great, we can have a go at Florida. So who's on our shit list? Uh, DeSantis, okay, let's have a go at Florida. Um, let's go kill some Floridians uh, and uh, wipe out some of their boats. I mean, is this point... And, and nobody, nobody stopped them. And nobody is trying to stop them. It, it, it's insanity and at some point. See, that's the thing. You have a COVID war going on. There must be intelligence agencies that are on a globalist side and some that are actually on side of some sort of conservative common well, the sense. NSA, the National Security Agency, I know, are extremely nice people uh, and they are patriotic. But they've got the huge, huge problem that the Germans, after 9-11, the Germans uh, were very worried about the CIA investigation 9-11, which I was involved in. Uh, they were desperately worried about the possibility of George W. Bush getting accurate intelligence. So they created the director, the uh, uh, director of national intelligence, DNI, in order to block critical intelligence from reaching the president. One side advised this, the NSA about the DVD and the location of their headquarters, and they'd moved a bird overhead and told them where Osama bin Laden was, and they moved a bird overhead to safe, safe house, as we discussed last time. Yeah. Uh, it became absolutely vital to keep the NSA away from the president. And the structure of American intelligence is such that everything is funneled through DNI, and the DNI serves a similar function to the cabinet office. The British agencies, MI5, MI6, GCHQ, Defense Intelligence Staff, uh, they're all under the control, effectively, directly or indirectly, of the cabinet office. And the role of British, the role of the cabinet office is to keep the British prime minister in the dark. This is it. You, you treat it like a mushroom. Uh, uh, and, and you feed, you keep her in the dark and feed her shit. The no offense intended. Now, uh, 
the DNI fulfills a similar function in America to the Cabinet Office in London. So its role, its primary, the primary role of the DNI is to deprive the president of intelligence, unless he happens to be working for the Germans like Obama, in which case there's a free flow of intelligence. Uh, Obama, of course, uh, was uh, born in uh, what is now Kenya, exactly. Um, and his father was a German asset. He was a, a Mau Mau terrorist. Not, not. Uh, he wasn't running around macheting people to death, but he was involved in finance and gun running. So his father was a gun runner, and, and we we yeah. had a file on about. So that's why, partly why I learned about Obama. I knew about Obama back in the nineteen nineties because I used to sit with old Africa hands, who now suddenly no longer with us. But I sat as a judge on the Immigration Appeal Tribunal, and we had intelligence officers from what had been colonies um, sitting as judges, uh, either at first instance or as lay members on appeal. Uh, district district officers, um, uh, colonial special branch officers, uh, MI6, so on. Uh, very well-informed people. And we've been keeping tabs on, we knew about Obama's birth back in 1960 because we were keeping tabs on his old man, because his old man was Mau Mau. So we knew his old man was running guns to the, the Kenyan terrorists. Um, and we wanted to know what he was doing. So we found out about the mistress and found out about the birth. And, and that went on That went on Obama Sr.'s file. And then, of course, we created a file uh, for Obama. In the end, we created a file on Obama Jr. And, so and that, file, that file is a very old file. The file on Obama Jr. goes back probably to the 1970s, certainly goes back to the 1980s, uh, uh, because he was tracked when he went out to Indonesia. We thought, what's this What's this son of a German spy doing in Indonesia? Um, uh, we were monitoring him in Indonesia. And we have, we actually have, British intelligence actually has some quite good sources in Indonesia, partly because we were very close to the Dutch, uh, who used to run Indonesia. And became familiar with the old families. Uh, in, in Indonesia, uh, the power structures in Indonesia are opaque, a bit like uh, America and Britain. Um, it's not like Russia, where it's a democracy and there's an elected president, and you know who's in charge. Um, the the st power structures in Indonesia are very, very opaque. There's some very powerful old families, as there are in China, uh, mm -hmm. who tend to have uh, sit on very large gold reserves and effectively control the currency, which gives them control of the country. Um, very, very well informed. And the Dutch were in touch with uh, some of these families. Some were pro-Dutch, some were anti-Dutch. And uh, we had good tabs. We, we kept in close touch with the Dutch. The Dutch obviously were very unhappy about the German invasion in 1940. But Anglo-Dutch cooperation predated 1940. Um, there was a thing called ABDA, American, British, Dutch, Australian, um, uh, that force was created in 1940 as a naval counterweight to Japan. The ABDA force was defeated in the Battle of the Java Sea, but um, and, uh, the Dutch destroyer Courtenier, and uh, there, there were a number of Dutch vessels, the, the Java and the De Reuter, I think, were there. Um, uh, the, people forget that the Dutch were actively involved in resisting the Japanese invasion of the Dutch East Indies. So yeah. we, we were quite... <clears throat> we had MI6 had some surprisingly good contacts in Indonesia, and uh, we were certainly following Barry Sotero out in out in Indonesia. When you say Indonesia, I can't help to think uh, Nazis. Nazis. Well, it's, Indonesia. it's called Indonesia now, but it's the Dutch East Indies. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of Germans that ended up in Indonesia with a lot of uh, gold. That's oh disappeared in Indonesia. Uh, there was even rumored said that Hitler was seen in Indonesia and lived well, in that. No, he, uh, Hitler, Hitler died. Hitler, I don't think Hitler actually ever left Austria. We know he was moved down into Austria yeah. at the end of the war. Uh, but I don't think he ever made it as far as Indonesia. Mind you, a doppelganger might have made it to Indonesia. That, that was the great, the Jerry's are great believers in doppelgangers. So, uh, yes. There, there, there were, I, how many doppelgangers Adolf had, nobody knows. Uh, I, I, I think he was at least four doppelgangers. Uh, anybody in Germany who was the right height who could grow a Hitler moustache, well, that's not difficult, uh, and had a, had the wacky hairstyle um, and sounded a bit crazy, 
you know, uh, they would, they would, they would say, ah, oh, Adolf Hitler substitute. We have a, we have a job for you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the bad news for the doppelgangers, of course, is that once once Hitler was dead, there was no longer they were they were redundant. And German intelligence are, are, are still are as brutal as they were in the 1930s. If redundancy in the German intelligence context means a bullet in the head, if you're lucky. <laughs> But um, I actually had somebody, I usually don't do questions, but one somebody asked me uh, the history of the DVD and how can they learn more about it. I thought I'd just throw that at you right now. Well, yes. Well, I think uh, at the risk of blowing my own trumpet, and you know how keen I am to hide my lights under a bushel. Oh, no. no, no. Blowing, there, is, there is only one history of the DVD. That's it. Spy Hunter. And I'll, say, I'll sell you a copy, but uh, I have to charge you 30 quid, post, 30 pounds sterling postage and packing on top of the 25 pound for the book. So it's not... A cheap exercise buying the book but that is the only published history of the dvd one or two authors have referred to it um my colleague on the american military university where i was on the faculty up till 2010 when i resigned to write the book the book writing spy hunter was a major you know it's, it's uh, yes the research involved the writing involved was considerable and it was virtually a full-time task for two years when well, I came back to the bar April 2012 broke off for a test case in January um, from November 2010 the book took from November 2010 to April 2012 to write the the first version of the book went into US Naval Institute in March 2012 uh, so it was a full-time occupation for 18 or so months and reflected years of research prior yeah. to writing the book. Uh, and I had a colleague uh, on the American Military University faculty before I retired, before I resigned in 2010. I was on the adjunct faculty. It was an online university, Pentagon accredited courses. I had students who needed you know, Professor. I was Professor Shrimpton, and I would get emails say or messages on the on the system saying. Uh, 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 dear Professor Shrimpton, I have to go into Iran tomorrow. Uh, but can I have, can I have a, an extra week's extension on my essay? And I said, of course. Sounds like you're doing good work. <laughs> uh, one of my students was an intelligence officer of an infantry division in Iraq, and he said, "Well, we, we got a bit of a battle going on in Fallujah. Can I have an extra two weeks for my course materials?" Said, Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I understood in the way of special forces. If any request from special forces got granted. <laughs> Yeah, or this, I was enrolled in American Military University for the oh, longest. Were you? I was, and that's how I ended up writing my books because, well, wow. you have to, have to turn in a paper, and you well, have about seven years to turn in a paper. And I ended up keeping writing books and scripts instead. Well, and I, was, I, never, I was on the faculty of AMU, and we, they, they well, I had a colleague teaching counterintelligence, uh, Paul Metcalf. Oh, we uh, lost, lost touch a long time ago. Uh, he taught the DVD. Ah. And his, source, his sources on the DVD weren't entirely the same as mine. Christopher Story also published uh, an article about the DVD in International Currency Review before he was assassinated. He was assassinated by induced uh, liver cancer. Uh, but before he was assassinated, uh, one of the reasons why he was assassinated, he went public on the DVD. Uh, so Spy Hunter is not the only published source on the DVD. And... Uh, it has been taught at least for several years. I don't know what the current position is, but it was taught for several years at AMU, American Military University, on a counterintelligence course. If anybody's out there and you're seriously interested in the field of intelligence and <coughs> counterintelligence, you know, intelligence and national security, um, I can recommend AMU. Um, it, it, it the, the academic standards uh, some people are a bit sniffy because it's online the academic standards at amu are actually quite high um and i certainly rec recall serious internal discussions about grade deflation and so on the the, the amu is well run and their courses are quite good and some of the professors are, are really know their stuff if you're thinking of being a professor at amu think again because it's hard work and i i I had to stand down. I couldn't write a book and teach at the same time. Uh, some universities you can write and teach. AMU, um, 
uh, required a real commitment from the professors yeah. in terms of time. There, there was a lot of marking, a lot of coursework, uh, and you are expect, you know, course development. These, these things, it was almost a full-time, it wasn't a full-time occupation for me, but uh, it, it, didn't, it did not leave enough time. There wasn't enough time for me to write the book and research it um, yeah. and uh, continue teaching at AMU. And I, I have to say, I was sorry. To, uh, I mean, I, I wasn't pushed out of AMU. I, I resigned. Um, I was sorry to resign from AMU uh, because I thoroughly enjoyed teaching. I've always enjoyed teaching. Yeah. I was a university I, law lecturer. I agree. I, I always enjoy teaching, especially te lecturing military history and what, what we do. And I was thinking about... Oh, uh, AMU, AMU have some very good military history courses. And I, I actually could quite like, if you're out there and you're thinking of a guest lecturer. Uh, I have done guest lectures at uh, University of California, Los Angeles, uh, uh, UCLA. I did a, uh, the Pinochet event there. Uh, so I, I presentations at universities, uh, guest lecturing, I am uh, definitely up for. Uh, you know what, I, that, that might University be- University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. I, I gave a presentation on one of my cases, the metric martyr case. I thoroughly enjoy that. I enjoy interacting with students. I thoroughly enjoyed interacting, particularly with the military and intelligence students at AMU. They were a really good bunch of students. And, and some of our coursework, when, when I taught, I was teaching one of my courses was propaganda and I taught global warming as an exercise in propaganda, which it is. It, the global warming theory is pure propaganda. Uh, it's absolute gibberish. It's complete nonsense. Uh, but it follows the girl. It's a classic illustration, the single most important and probably the classic, the classic illustration of the Goebbels big lie technique. And so it's 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 uh, it, it, it is a technique that was refined by Goebbels proteges after the war. And uh, it's the descendants of Goebbels propaganda ministry that that uh, are pushing it and uh, it is the it's, it's, it's the example of big lie and my my students initially said no professor the big global warming's happening yada 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 and i said let's research it and so they did so i set papers on it and the research the students came up with was brilliant and i think almost almost unanimously if not unanimously uh, the course agreed well, hang on, the professor has a point that there is nothing to this theory. It's all obvious nonsense. CO2 is only a third, uh, only a 30th of CO2 emissions are, are generated by human activity, 3.3% or thereabouts. Um, only CO2 is responsible for about 5% of global warming. <clears throat> if it's only responsible for 5% of global warming, uh, how can a 30th uh, 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 contribution to a gas that's responsible for a 20th of global warming, that's well, one six hundredth. Make, in, make a conceivable difference to the climate. Yeah, but but in order to to cower a a, po a population of generally well educated people, you have to come up with a crisis that's bigger than they. Which oh, is absolutely, yeah, it, it's it's extraordinary. We we think we are intelligent and well informed in the West. Uh, yeah. In fact, we, we, uh, the the West has entered into a period of mass delusion. We we saw a classic example of mass delusion in Britain in the last fortnight. Uh, the Chancellor of Exchequer, Kwasi Karteng, who is actually quite bright uh, for a cabinet minister, with respect, and is surprisingly economic literate for a Chancellor of the Exchequer. It, it's extraordinary. Um, but normally, normally the cabinet secretary determines cabinet appointments. This time round, uh, the cabinet secretary didn't have anything on Liz Truss. I mean, she hasn't taken bungs. Uh, she's not a lesbian. Uh, she actually sleeps with her husband. Uh, it's extraordinary, you know. We actually have a prime minister that sleeps with their spouse, and uh, and hasn't got an offshore bank account, as far as we know, and hasn't um, uh, hasn't been taking bribes. So we have a, a prime minister who ha a, a hasn't taken bribes. B is uh, her, her her sexuality is as stated on the tin. So she's heterosexual. She's married. Uh, is in love with her husband, who's a very nice chap, but has got a lovely family. Uh, she's apparently I don't know, but but I know people who do. She's a Apparently, a very nice person. Uh, also, surprisingly intelligent for a prime minister, and she appointed a chancellor of exchequer who understood something about economics. Not a, not a huge amount, but at least something. That's that's almost unprecedented. We haven't had a chancellor of exchequer in Britain who understood economics uh, even partially um, for 
uh, years and years and years. Winston Churchill was probably the last. And in the 1920s, and he sensibly reduced the top rate of tax from 45p, which is ridiculously high, to 40p. That would not, in fact, have cost the Treasury a penny. Uh, under the Laffer curve, as you probably know, you reduce the top rate of tax. You reduce tax rates on the Laffer curve. At some point, you reduce tax rates too low and you end up reducing your revenue. But where we are in Britain with our tax rates, we're right in the middle of the Laffer curve. And as you row, row back on tax, you will increase tax receipts because you grow the economy. Yes. And you bring in people from abroad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you attract high earners to your country, um, but you grow the economy. And you end up with, with higher tax receipts. If you want to increase tax receipts, lower taxes within, within the Laffer range. And so he did this. Uh, the Treasury, who are normally fairly stupid and don't understand economics, one of the reasons why Britain has performed so badly in the last century. Uh, the Treasury, who didn't understand what Calvin, what Calvin Coolidge had a brilliant Treasury secretary uh, who reduced taxes after World War One, and America paid off its World War One debts very, very quickly because it cut taxes and increased the tax take. We didn't. Yeah. We were lumbered with the Treasury, who uh, uh, didn't know what they were doing. Um, therefore, we ended up with the, you know, uh, uh, having to cut naval expenditure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and leave the Far East open to the Japanese because we didn't have any money in the kitty because the, the Treasury were in control of our economy and they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know how to raise tax uh, or raise tax receipts. Yeah. And uh, uh, the Treasury, for once, got it right. The, the Treasury prediction was this cut from 45p to 40p will not cost us anything. This will actually increase tax receipts. And there was such a huge reaction from the media, from the Labour Party, from the Liberal Democrats, from the Scotch Nats. Uh, every economic illiterate in the country seemed to get together in what the Prime Minister has rightly described as an anti-growth coalition and yeah. insisted that, that this was an unfunded tax cut, which is complete and utter nonsense to talk about unfunded tax cut. Tax cuts pay for themselves within the Laffer range. And uh, he was forced into a humiliating reversal on Monday. Uh, at no point did, did it occur to the public, uh, actually, the Chancellor might know what he's doing. Actually, the Treasury might for once have got it right. And we're cutting off our nose to spite our face because all we're going to do now is reduce tax receipts compared to where they would be by keeping the 45p rate. Uh, it was mass delusion. Uh, uh, the country was acting irrationally. There was a huge poll lead for Labour all based on the irrational theory that tax raising is linear. So uh, th these nutters, if you, if you ask them, well, the, the trouble is it's a bit like global warming. The minute you start asking rational questions, uh, people get very upset and, and suddenly start to think things through and then realize, oh, I've been believing in a lie. Uh, according to these nutters, if we were to double the top tax rate from 45p to 90p in the pound, we'd raise twice as much tax. No. no. No, no. You'd probably raise half as much tax because you'd strangle the economy. And that's uh, when you start to rise. But that theory that if you double 45p tax rate to 90p, you double the amount of tax. The tax raising is linear, not a bell curve like the Laffer curve. Uh, you can argue about the shape of the Laffer curve, but the argument is about the shape, not about whether there is a curve or not. Uh, like here, when we just spend a trillion dollars to reduce inflation. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. I, I mean, uh, so an example, a classic example that will be studied for centuries to come, I'm sure, of oh. mass delusion, of hysteria gripping a population. And the global warming is an example of mass hysteria. But this is where we have the governance of emotionalism versus pragmatism. Exactly. We don't exactly. exactly. Pragmatic, common sense methods of governing our countries in exactly. any way. And that's, I, I guess that's as, I, as I tell my students on AMU, uh, on, at uh, uh, AMU, the big lie technique can be effective. It is possible and has uh, has been shown to be effective with global warming. It is possible to get to fool most of the people. You don't fool all of the people. It's not possible to fool all of the people. It is possible to fool most of the people uh, for most of the time. And it is possible to create a mass illusion uh through the big lie technique but the big lie technique only gets people to accept the lie it doesn't turn the lie into the truth 
the global true. warming hypothesis is flawed. I mean, it's fatally flawed. It's actual nonsense. It's complete gibberish. So why are uh, they hanging on to it? What, what is the end game? Where are they? They oh, go. I mean, I mean uh, advancing China, and, and the, the the end game is the decline and collapse of Western economies. The decline of the West and the collapse of Western economies. Uh, global warming in Britain is costing the government at least twenty billion pound a year, probably more. Uh, uh, what were the decarbonizing our economies uh, is a, a huge and expensive mistake. The Chinese are not making it because the Chinese are not completely stupid. Um, they're not as bright as I think they are, but they're not completely stupid. So, so we fairly, see fairly bright. We see a multifaceted attack on anything Western, anything from oh, a yeah. traditional lifestyle, uh, democracy, commerce, democracy, economy, every, everything. Right. So they eventually will destroy the Western, uh, the Western world, and 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 the civilization that's been. If built. they don't stop them, yeah, civilization <laughs> is under threat. It's under attack. And, and we need to defend it. And that, that's one of the things I one of the reasons why I'm here tonight. I am, I am defending Western values. I believe in Western <laughs> civilization. Uh, and I think we have a very bright future. A friend of mine, uh, Jacob rees Mogg, who's in the cabinet, has just announced uh, development in uh, Derby on an old coal-powered station site of a new fusion reactor. Mm. Uh, I think the time scale is a bit long. I, I much prefer, uh, much prefer to have it going in 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 ten years rather than the best part of twenty. But uh, the, the fusion power, for example, is has enormous potential. Uh, coming back to the point about fossil fuels, I, I'm not saying we should burn fossil fuels so cool, so called. In fact, I'm against. I would rather move our energy mix away from fossil fuels. I have no problem with moving our energy mix away from fossil fuels um, on grounds of pollution, on grounds of uh, the cost of them, on grounds of you're vulnerable to the suppliers, etc., etc., etc. Gradually, gradually, but but phase out fossil fuels, but but bring in <clears throat> nuclear, bring in fusion. Uh, in parts of the world, like the Southern Belt. The Sun Belt states in the United States, you can use solar. I'm against wind because it's intermittent and ugly, uh, yeah. but you can reduce, uh, uh, you know, the, the, there are parts of the world where solar energy is going to be uh, uh, entirely practical. Um, in Britain, we've got the Pentland Firth. Well, I think it's been calculated we could generate 60 gigawatts of power. 60 gigawatts, that's a big number, mm. uh, just by having turbines in the Pentland Firth, which in the old days, the argument was, well, they'll rust and the maintenance costs will be very high because the salt water will get at the, uh, whatever you use for the turbine blades. But uh, these days, we don't. We can have non-metallic turbine blades. Yeah. Um, and that means turbines in salt water uh, could be made to work and, and be made, by the way, could be economical. Uh, that, that's a massive source of power that we've overlooked. The Seven Barrage in England, that we have a huge tidal I think it's the second largest tidal reach in the world is in the Severn, which is a large river, the, the longest river in Britain, and between the borders of Wales and England. And that can <clears throat> generate large amounts of electricity. I think it's so be before we get to the point where we can sustain uh, civilized life yeah. with, with alternatives, will they not have managed to destroy the Western civilized countries before? Well, <laughs> If we don't get a grip, if we don't break up Germany, if we don't break up the DVD, if we don't break up the power of the cabinet office in England, in England, we the first priority is to get rid of Simon Case, the cabinet secretary, uh, break up the power of the cabinet office. Well, I think that will now happen because the cabinet secretary has got himself involved in a coup against the prime minister or an attempted coup, which uh, has in fact really? failed. Well, yes, because they, they were attempting to force, uh, they didn't just want a humiliating u-turn on the 45p top rate of tax they wanted the government to collapse they wanted ah. this trust to be forced out and the party is now swinging around behind us she's made an excellent speech today and i think cabinet uh, um, um, simon case is an ally called michael gove who's a snake no offense intended um he's a, a real sleazebag i've met him don't like him uh he didn't like me he was well he's wary of me he didn't it's not that he didn't dislike me he was very wary of me and we met at a Tory party conference in Bournemouth when Ian Duncan Smith was leader about 20 years ago. 
Um, he, 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 Simon Case is working hard to undermine the Prime Minister's majority, and Michael Gove is setting himself up as an alternative lead, you know, lead of the internal opposition, uh, trying to deprive Liz Truss of a parliamentary majority. The thinking is that Liz Truss must not be allowed to implement her policies, uh, and let's get Michael Gove to stir yeah. things up on the Tory backbenches. Now, that's all been spotted. Simon Case is out. I might be in. We should wait and see. I might be. Back. I might be in as Lord Chancellor, which is something that was discussed uh, before Liz Truss uh, uh, won the internal leadership election. Yes. Uh, but that, those are the sort of things we have to do. Um, we have to break up the DVD, break up uh, the powers of the Cabinet Office in England, break up the powers of the federal bureaucracy in the states, get somebody sensible like Donald Trump back into the White House. Um, and Do you think German people, if they're going to start freezing to death over the winter, we've seen all the reductions. Oh, and yeah, the Jerry's, the Jerry's are not well, going, but we're going to have a lot of unhappy Jerry's this winter because they're going to freeze to death and they're going to, you know, their willies are going to be dropping off and they're, they're it's going to be like Moscow in 41 where, the, where their <laughs> willies are dropping off the, 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 the soldiers. Uh, and uh, there's one thing, no, nothing upsets a Jerry more than having his willy drop off because it's frozen. Uh, <laughs> they, they'll be getting frostbite and so on. Oh, uh, really? So I think guarantee we're going to have a lot of unhappy Jerry's over this winter, which might persuade the Germans uh, that, that the war and the, the sponsoring Ukraine in the war on the, 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 the Russia-Ukrainian war, not such, not such a good idea. They might even go back to nuclear power. Uh, they might even develop energy from waste. It's another area of energy that we've overlooked. Well, not overlooked. It's been deliberately suppressed. Uh, we have huge amounts of waste. We generate vast amounts of waste we can burn that for energy and uh we can now control the dioxins that come from burning plastic what are your thoughts on that on the pipeline explosions is that part of the the, the CIA, war going on cia backed by by uh, clearly cleared by the biden administration uh yeah. i think victoria newland signed off on that uh, i think the whether they put it in front of the president or i don't know the, the, when you've got a president who's gaga like biden you've got to be slightly careful uh, one of the problems of the Gaga president is you you go to Mr. President, uh, we want to do X, Y, and Z, uh, X, Y, and Z. Uh, he, he might at a press conference blurt it out. Yes. Uh, we're going to be very careful. Uh, we don't want the guy blurting it out or forgetting where he is or forgetting. You know, it's bad enough I mean, to, to, to have a, a speech in a district where the congresswoman has been murdered, stroke died in a car wreck. The, the jury's out on that. It, it looks, let's just say it's an unhappy looking car wreck. It's certainly one requiring careful investigation. Uh, but to, to pretend that she's still alive when you're meeting her family two days later, that's ludicrous. I mean, that, that, that's, that's sit for a politician, let alone a president, that's seriously gaga. That, you mean that, it's up there with, with having a vice president standing on the DMC talking about our great partnership with the Republic of North Korea? <laughs> well, I mean, th this is the problem. The Democrat, the Democrats have a real problem. They got a Gaga president and an idiot vice president. Now, the vice president isn't isn't Gaga. No offense intended, but she's an idiot, um, <laughs> and uh, she's she's going to be even worse than Biden. So uh, you can't. Uh, I, I mean, it's slightly odd. Uh, obviously, Biden chose Kamala Harris as her as his running mate on the basis that nobody would. He was protecting himself. Nobody yeah. would put him out because that would mean putting Kamala, Kamala Harris. It was a bit like Bush Senior, um, who ha had Dan Quayle. He selected Dan Quayle, not because Dan Quayle was any good, but because he was hopeless. Uh, <laughs> and nobody would want Dan Quayle. It's who would who want Dan Quayle in charge of a country, let alone a, a nuclear armed superpower? Uh, yeah. Dan Quayle, who couldn't even spell potatoes properly. Uh, there's no way in the world people are going to push him out. Um, the CIA and NSA had the same problem when forcing out Nixon, they first, if you recall, because yeah. friends of mine were involved, uh, a deep throat, there was no deep throat, there were several deep throats, <laughs> deep throats, plural. Uh, one of the intelligence officers who was one of the deep throats uh, involved in that, who was retaliating for the loss of his assets in Saigon and South Vietnam, he was in charge of the Phoenix program in South Vietnam, good man. Uh, Phoenix program is a very successful program where you guys managed to wipe out about 25,000 communists. Well, 20,000 communists, a couple of thousand liberals, some doctors, a few teachers, and, and somebody, anybody pissed off the headman of the village that week. 
Um, but most of the people who were whacked were, were commies. And it was a very successful program. The North Vietnamese understood, so did the Germans, that there was no point winning the Vietnam War and having the CIA's network in South Vietnam still in situ. So the network was wiped out. Uh, names were dropped on fax machines by German assets in Washington. Uh, there was a secret deal at Paris, which Harvey Feldman knew about. He had helped set up the Paris peace talks. Um, there was a secret deal and Nixon signed off on it. And that's why he had to go. Nixon went because he had sold the CIA's network in South Vietnam down the river. And that meant everybody getting their head chopped off or, uh, you know, chucked out of helicopters. So there, there wasn't, they weren't retired nicely. They weren't put on a pension um, uh, or put on a plane to Bangkok. Uh, they were whacked and in many cases tortured first. In most cases, probably tortured first. So it was a very brutal exercise and uh, it was decided that Nixon had to go. But before they got rid of Nixon, they had to get rid of Spiro Agnew because nobody, nobody with a brain was going to put Spiro Agnew into the White House. Uh, <laughs> and it, uh, the Democrats had the same problem that the boys did when they were offloading Nixon. Um, how on earth, w what do we do? We, we're lumber, we get rid of Biden, uh, Article 25, that's it, 25th Amendment, that's easy. We get, so we offload Biden and then we end up with Kamala Harris. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge, huge problem for the Democrats, and it's one of their own making. So I don't have any sympathy for them. They shouldn't be there anyway because they'd lost the election. Donald Trump should be in the White House because he won the election. And so you don't have to like Donald, I happen to like Donald Trump, although I've never met him. Um, I don't agree with all his policies, but, but uh, he was the elected president. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you agree with the president or not. If he's elected, he wins the election. He is installed as president. The one, the one who wins the most vote, electoral college votes wins the election. Donald Trump won over 400 electoral college votes. He, therefore, should have been sworn in for a second term as president of the United States. And it was the duty of every loyal American, certainly in the services and in the bureaucracy, to uh, swing in uh, behind him. Uh, that's what democracy is all about, Tino. Uh, in a democracy, the I think is in our style now, I believe. I think it's taken over by uh, bureaucrats and the media. Why is the global media, I mean, okay, they're, they're owned by relatively few people, but why are they not doing the jobs as reporters should, having integrity? Well, they, they've been undermined. It, it, it only, there's a huge problem with concentration of ownership, and there's a massive problem. The West cannot survive if we continue with. Uh, high yield offshore trading programs because it leads to huge concentration of wealth and allows Germany, which controls the programs, to push people about if they've got any money. Um, and we have a massive concentration of uh, media ownership in the West, uh, far too many titles in far too few hands, and it's very easy to give orders to newspapers to print rubbish. So we will continue to have uh, misreporting, we'll continue to have the newspapers to report rubbish, uh, you know. Or, or, almost every newspaper in Britain, for example, is blaming the Russians for blowing up their own pipelines. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just completely silly. Why would you blow up your own pipeline? But th this is you know, five minutes analysis should be enough to persuade you that this yeah. is this simply cannot be. This is not credible. Uh, the idea that the Russians would blow up their own pipelines when they could just turn the gas off if they want. I mean, the Russians control the flow of gas through Nord Stream 1 and would have controlled it through Nord Stream 2. You don't need to blow up your own pipeline. That's no. just nonsense. Yet this nonsense, bad, you know, it's as silly as global warming, this nonsense Maybe the, it, maybe it warming people. by every media outlet in Britain is just churning out this gibberish. Uh, at some, if we stop the trading programs, uh, get the money offshore, get the money, bring the money back from offshore, which will deal with debt. I mean, it'd be a huge, huge impact on Western economies. Yes. Uh, controlled inflation, because inflation is generated by uh, this co main cause of inflation is expansion of the money supply. And the money supply has been expanded by uh, offshore high yield trading. So we, control inflation, we, we sort out debt, we have enough money to spend on defence and all the things that we need, sensible things like aircraft carriers and tanks, all the sensible things we government should be spending money on. Yes, yes. Uh, so we can, we, we can turn things around. Um, uh, uh, just one point on fossil fuels, I, 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 we, uh, 
ended up distracting myself. You didn't distract me, but I distracted myself. Uh, fossil fuels. I was talking about the conference I attended in Moscow. Uh, the big boys were there from Shell. The big, the big oil people were there, Shell and BP and so on. And I was, because energy was one of the issues. And I was struck as Russia is one of the, the world's what second largest energy provider. And I was struck. Uh, these people were telling me over drinks well we're getting we're getting oil now five miles deep and i said no, sorry 15 15 miles 15 miles and i knew there were some pretty deep oil wells and I, i'd ask the question uh, how, how deep are these well, what's your deepest oil well now in russia oh about 15 miles i said how the hell can the fuels be fossil fuels? Uh, how many fossils are you finding at 15 miles below the surface of the earth? There are no fossils. I mean, I live not on, in the West Country in England. Uh, we have a wonderful coastline not far from here called the Jurassic Coast, hmm. which is where the first dinosaur fossils were discovered. And one of the reasons the dinosaur fossils were discovered is because they're, they're in the cliffs which are only a few hundred feet high. I mean, it's the, it's, it's the south coast of Britain. It's not uh, you know, it's not the Andes or the Himalayas. Uh, and you've only got to go down a few hundred feet. Uh, in, in this case, erosion had exposed the fossils. Yes. Uh, but fossils 65 million plus years old, all dinosaur fossils by definition, uh, are over, apart from Biden when he's dead. I mean, uh, his, his, he will be a modern fossil. Uh, but... Uh, all fossils of dinosaurs, by definition, have to be over 65 million years old because that's when the dinosaurs were died out. They were wiped out by the asteroid, but obviously it helped. Um, it was a process that lasted a million years or whatever. Um, a bit like the decline of the West. It was something that took place over a period of time. Yes. But if all the dinosaurs died out, you, know, you, you have the dinosaurs around for... Uh, uh, over 100 million years. Uh, these fossils were accessible from a beach. Uh, to dig for a dinosaur fossil, you don't need to go down very far. If you've no. got dinosaur fossils in Arizona. Uh, you don't need to dig a trench 15 miles deep. <laughs> uh, how can they be fossil fuels? Uh, what fossils are you going to find at 15 miles deep? And if there are no fossils at 15 miles deep, then how, where, where's the fuel coming from? I mean, it's just the point. I, I, it, it's not something that struck me 17 years ago. And I, I never, I, when I asked the boys at Shell, there were some fairly senior executives, I said, well, how, how, why are you still calling it fossil fuel if, if you're getting it from 15 miles deep? Um, I've never had a satisfactory answer to that. Uh, how is it that we, end, if it's fossil fuel, how does it end up at uh, 50, you know, 40 miles below the, 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 the deepest fossil? 40 now, I don't know what the deepest fossil is, but because I'm, I'm not a fossil hunter. Not uh, that deep. I'd be very surprised if you had to dig more than half a mile deep to find a fossil uh, of any living creature. Uh, I, 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 I do not understand uh, how you can get fossils. I, I don't understand how you can get any fuel that comes from fossils at 15 miles deep. If, if somebody's listening to the broadcast and is a geologist or a, a fossil hunter or a paleontologist, they can say, oh, well, that's easy, Michael. This is the explanation. I, I haven't heard, I have not heard a rational explanation for uh, the depths of fuel, the depths at which we're finding oil and natural gas, if they are indeed uh, fossil fuel. So I, I don't use the expression. I use the expression fossil fuels with inverted, yeah. with inverted commas. Not, con yes. not some, some of them, some of the fuel may come from fossils. Not convinced all the fuel comes from fossils. Um, and we have quite enough of it that we can make a gradual transition to different. Uh, oh, there's, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I was alive by definition since I'm 65 years old. Uh, I was alive when the Germans organized the energy crisis in 73, which was organized by, again, high yield programs. Yes. The, 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 the Arabs don't make their money selling oil. The Arabs made their money by taking oil cash and trading it offshore, which allowed the Germans to tell the Arabs to jack up the oil prices, which logically would have undermined the markets 
uh, and was not in the Arabs' own best interest. But because they were getting the money offshore, uh, they didn't care. They didn't care how much they depressed oil sales by. Uh, they were told to jack up oil prices, and they did. So when Jerry organized the first energy crisis in 73, uh, the, uh, we had all sorts of prognostications, Paul Ehrlich, you, you name it. Any number of German assets or people who favored Germany uh, or the depressives uh, and had a, a, just couldn't see a future for the West or humanity, uh, the sort of people who believe in global warming. Mm. Uh, th those days, they were talking about global cooling. They were talking about a new ice age. Yes, yes. Get I remember. Uh, uh, so they were talking about a new ice age, but they're also saying fossil fuels will, will, will run out by the end of the century, 30, 35 years. That was, that was a widespread belief in the early 70s. Well, we're now, boys, we're now nearly 50 years on from the first German energy crisis. Or German sponsored energy crisis, uh, we've actually got greater, we've got more reserve, more proven reserves now than there were 50 years ago. Uh, that again suggests that that the supply of that, that we're not dealing with a limited supply of gas and oil, that there are natural processes that we may not fully understand deep inside the surface of the earth, which is producing yeah. uh, oil and natural gas. But putting that aside, I, I still don't favor oil and natural gas as long term. Uh, long term so why are they not uh, embracing electrical new energy cars yes petrol gasoline for motor cars yes yeah. because it's highly efficient but uh, why why are the green not embracing uh nuclear nuclear then or even nuclear based on thorium that much well uh, well nuclear based on thorium exactly thorium power is is the way to go with fission power i'm convinced of that certainly yeah. for electricity generation uh possibly not for uh nuclear reactors for submarines and uh, warships but the uh yes thorium for uh, powerful thorium stations producing say and, and double stations for safety so you have two two stations side by side yeah. with two separate control rooms so I don't know one. well the greens the greens are pursuing in many cases a political agenda like those idiots yeah. who disrupted the prime minister's speech in birmingham this morning uh one of them was interviewed on sky afterwards and kept on banging about benefits well what's benefits got to do with with green policy um, she's just a left winger uh, yeah. pursuing silly left wing ideas. Uh, I, 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 I could see the argument for increasing benefits in line with inflation. There are also arguments against, particularly since we've now been forced to keep the 45p tax raise, which means that the total tax take will not be as high as it would have been. So there's a few billion we'll have to find to fund the, the keeping the tax at 45p in the pound. Uh, which may have to come off the benefits bill, but uh, they yeah, they're, they're pursuing a political agenda. They're not that interested in the planet as such. No, it's an emotional argument that they'll yes, try. In some, they'll in some cases, in some cases, they're genuine. I mean, she was banging on about fracking as well, but there's no, there's no evidence that fracking is. I mean, I, I, I a lot of this talk about groundwater being contaminated, so on is hugely exaggerated fracking is an yeah. obvious potential source of energy that we should be uh, we should be pursuing in britain it's been very successful in the united states so if we're going to change this whole direction if the the, the germans the americans the europeans are going to re want to return to a common sense style of governance it's going oh. to come from the people within it's going to have is, is this is, are we looking at some sort of a a, a soft revolution from within from people who had enough in order to save yes save. I, I we're certainly not looking at uh, my old friend general pinochet had a slightly more uh uh a kinetic solution uh and he had people put up against the wall and shot uh, i don't think we need to go down that route and general pinochet my, uh, the dear old general pinochet was a very nice the nicest military dictator ever met uh uh, dear old General Pinochet wasn't actually that happy about having people shot. He, he'd have uh, given a choice. He'd have he'd have liked a bloodless coup if possible. Oh, coup is such a strong word. Change of government. Yes. Um, the uh, but uh, no, we don't we don't need to go down that route. And I uh, even in Brazil, I don't think a, a military government would be a sensible idea. If Bolsonaro loses the uh, election, and it looks like it's fraud. Uh, I think there will be a military coup in, in Brazil, but 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 I, I don't think it's desirable. Um, so we're not. Uh, let, let's push all talk of military coups to one side. 
Uh, what's required is better intelligence and getting intelligence into the hands of the people who need to know. Prime Minister Liz Truss needs to know that the Cabinet Secretary is working with Michael Gove uh, and is also in talks with the Labour Party and the SNP uh, about going back and the Lib Dems about going back into the European single market. She needs to know about offshore high yield trading. She needs to know that the banks are sitting on several trillion, a, a large number of trillion, uh, many trillions of pounds of cash offshore on which they are not paying tax. She needs to know that all the arguments about tax and benefits and spending that, that are currently consuming her government and the party uh, are all a total, totally unnecessary uh, because there is trillions of pounds offshore that we can just onshore um, uh, and uh, radically turn uh, our economies around. Uh, uh, she needs to be fully briefed in on, on alternative energy sources. She needs to be fully briefed in on the Ukraine and the fact that the Ukrainians were planting an attack on the Donbass republics and uh, were involved in COVID. She also needs to be briefed in on COVID being a Chinese bioweapon. Uh, there was some fool on the Today programme only this morning talking about, uh, yesterday morning, talking about COVID as though it was a, a, a transfer from the animal kingdom. Well, no, it wasn't. No. no. But you have an intelligence transfer from the transfer from the Chinese kingdom, not the not the animal kingdom. <laughs> but you have an intelligent prime minister, seemingly right now. What are the Americans? Yes, it's, it's extraordinarily intelligent. I mean, by the I mean by the standards of prime ministers, uh, <laughs> uh, she is quite bright for a prime minister. And so, what are the Europeans and the Americans going to do? We don't seem to have that problem with intelligent leadership these days. <laughs> well, you don't have intelligence. Well, you've got Democrats, so you don't, yeah, obviously, obviously, you're not, you, there are no such you know, the, the intelligent Democrat is just an ox and oxymoron. Um, so your president is a moron, no offense intended, and your vice president is an idiot. Um, difficult. Uh, what you, I think, need in the states is uh, Donald Trump back in the White House. I'm not, Donald Trump's. You know, there are, the, Donald's not an easy man to advise. I, God knows I tried uh, when he was president. Uh, very difficult to get through to him uh, because everybody, everybody, everybody between me and Donald Trump is a bit like Oliver Stone. A anybody who could pass messages on just wouldn't. No. Nigel Farage, I kept asking my old friend Nigel, I said, look, I need to get messages through to Donald. They're being blocked. And Nigel would go and see him and would be staying at Mar-a-Lago or uh, you know, would be seeing the president but wouldn't pass the messages on. So yeah. the president never knew about the DVD and eventually the DVD sniffed him in 2020. So the poor man lost, won an election that was deprived of it, knew he was being deprived of it, but didn't know who was organising it or why. But has the time passed for elections in Europe and America? Is is there still hope that elections can... Oh, yes. I, I, think, I think the juries are going to be, uh, because of the widespread because of the huge row over the rigging of the 2020 election i think the juries are going to be very very cautious about rigging the midterms uh the midterms are coming up next month and i think that could clear the way for a restoration of depending on the results but uh it, it, certainly there is a path to having donald trump back in the white house next year it's okay. fairly straightforward you just have a big win for the democrat big win for the republicans in both houses they impeach Biden and Harris on the basis that they rigged the, They were aware of the election being rigged. They weren't organizing the rigging, but they were the beneficiaries of it and they knew. Therefore, they are guilty of offenses against the US Constitution. Therefore, they are impeachable. So you offload both of them. Uh, you get Sarah Palin would be uh, a sensible speaker. Uh, and it's just possible that Sarah Palin may be elected in Alaska. Uh, and either way, if you have a Republican control of the House, then the Speaker is uh, a <clears throat> Republican. Uh, and uh, then there's a fairly, once you've impeached, you impeach everybody ahead of the, the speaker. speaker. And you then have the Speaker in the White House. Now, that won't be Donald Trump because he's not standing for Congress. But the Speaker then makes Donald Trump his or her vice president. Now, let's say you have Sarah Palin as speaker, then you have President Palin, but she does a, de a deal with Trump. Say, look, you won the election, so you are the legitimate president. You belong in this office, I don't. Um, and she does a job swap. So yeah. she becomes president, she becomes speaker of the house, then she becomes president because Biden and Harris are impeached. Uh, the 
then I, I'd have to look up the, the order of precedence from memory. It goes president, vice president, speaker of the house, isn't it? Yes. Gerald Ford was speaker of the house. And then it's president. Is it president pro tem of the Senate? I remember when there was a Germans were trying to get Colin Powell in as president and they, they had to assassinate. I, 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 there was a time, but I had the speak, the orders of, of precedence absolutely clear in my mind. And, and uh, I, I, it was an Alaskan senator, I think, from memory, who was the president pro tem of the, the uh, pro tem of the Senate, uh, because the Jerry's needed to assassinate one, two, three, four. And they, they were all together in one space at the same time. And I knew the Germans were trying to maneuver Colin Powell into the White House. And I passed a very urgent warning to the State Department, sorry, to the Secret Service, saying, boys, you've got problems. I think the Jerry's are about to whack the president, the vice president, the president pro, tempor pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, because uh, they're all in the same building, happy to be Congress, uh, for the lying in state of President Reagan. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, security was, my warning was acted on. My security was up. I nearly got the governor of Wisconsin, I think, shot down. It's the only time I've ever had an American governor uh, put at risk. Uh, his pilot was a fool. Uh, the very clear instructions are given about aircraft approaching the Capitol during the yes. long state. And the pilot, the transponder went south. And the pilot, uh, the president of, I think it was Wisconsin, um, was flying in to Washington for the lying state. Uh, and his pilot carried on, even though his transponder had failed. He should have uh, immediately, he should have known not to enter restricted airspace with the transponder. Oh, yeah. uh, it looked like the plane had been hijacked. It looked like a 9-11 scenario. He nearly got shot down. <laughs> so I once nearly got a governor of Wisconsin shot down. If he's listening to this broadcast or somebody sends him a copy, apologies, but your pilot was a fool. A um, uh, <laughs> pilot should not, under any circumstances, have attempted to go fly over the middle of Washington, let alone the... No. Uh, no, without a working transponder. He should have... <laughs> I've to Andrew. He should have... He should have We've got Andrews on the blur and said, look, transponder failure, I need to divert um, and get safely on the ground ASAP, uh, not carry on as though nothing had happened. Oh. So before I let you go, so that's the possibility of the U.S., which will still cause massive unrest. That, that would bring Trump, yes, Trump and uh, uh, President Trump and Sarah Palin as vice president. That would be a very powerful team in the White House. And Sarah, Trump, uh, Sarah Palin is probably easier to advise, partly because she's a woman. Uh, women tend to be more open to new ideas and men men can be, you know, us blokes can be a bit rigid. I, in our I, I, was worried. I sometimes will tend to disagree with, the, with that, but um, <laughs> moving it's surprising. Uh, women, women police, when I was arrested, the, the, only, the only police officer showed any intelligence at all was a woman. Uh, mm. because she was willing to consider the issues fairly. And then, of course, she I'm talking about taking that. advice. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah. Uh, Sarah, I think Sarah Palin is probably would be easier to advise. So Sarah Palin is vice yeah. president, Donald Trump is president. Uh, and then we uh, clear the, the, abolish the director of national intelligence and clear the way for a flow of intelligence through to the president. Yeah. We need to understand that Osama bin Laden was taken out in 2009. We need to understand uh, who organized the 2020 coup. Uh, that removed, that prevented him from getting the, harvesting the, reaping the benefits of his, his very successful election campaign. Uh, the road in America. Open up, open up the flow of intelligence to the U.S. president and uh, and the British prime minister. We know how to do it in Britain. We just shut oh, down Europe. Europe. Europe's a problem. Uh, the EU is a problem. The EU will have to be broken up. Uh, <laughs> There's no possible prospect of democratic government in Europe, functioning democratic government with the EU in existence. So Western Europe, yes, they have got a problem. Uh, the Italians have just elected a new prime minister who's quite sensible, marginally to the right of centre. Um, she might be able to turn things around. I don't think she will because the Germans control the bureaucracy and the intelligence services, says me and so on. But, well, she might, she might be able to pull it off. I don't know. I don't know how good her intelligence sources are. That she, <clears throat> uh, it, 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 she may have some good sources in the Vatican. Yes, yes. She's a Catholic, I think, and I, yes, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I uh, just possible that she may be able to get some accurate and and actionable intelligence from the boys at the Vatican. Hmm. Pope well, Benedict. It will be interesting to see, and I also know that you have to go because you have to be in. <laughs> morning <laughs> well i'm in high court tomorrow morning presenting presenting a case yes uh, yes uh, I, have, I have my day job i have my day job in the morning i'm up early and i have papers to read and uh, and 
a case to prepare and dinner to eat as well. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, hungry. I have work to do. Yes, uh, uh, I'm enjoying the conversation, but uh, uh, needs must. Yes. Yes, yeah, and so at some point in time, we're we're going at some point in time uh, at the end of this month, we're going to have you and Joseph and hopefully Oliver Stone come on and talk about uh, 9-11 and... Um, yeah, that would be and, good. And, That'd be and, a, a three-way with Ollie Stone about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, you know, the 60th anniversary comes up next year. I think 60 years is long enough for the American people to be kept in the dark about who ordered the assassination of their beloved president. Uh, and whether he was a Republican or Democrat, he was a very fine man and yes. a patriot. And he was a great president. And uh, even though he's a Democrat, but uh, even as even though he's a Democrat, he should not have been shot. Uh, I think it's time the American people were told the truth. Oliver Stone is interested in the truth, but hasn't yet been briefed in on the DVD. He has been able to effectively dismantle the absurd theory that Lee Harvey Oswald shot the president when he didn't yeah. get a shot off at all. Uh, so he's blown up that theory out of the water for anyone who takes the trouble and care to. Uh, listen to his most recent documentary and 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 study the film JFK with with an open mind. Um, he's blown the Oswald theory out of the water. What he's not been able to do because nobody's told him about the DVD is work out who actually shot the president and why. I can tell him that, and uh, we could have a very serious discussion uh, about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And I think it's about time. Yeah, I think, I uh, after sixty years of bullshit. I think yeah. it's about time that uh, the American people were treated to uh, uh, a, a serious discussion about the assassination of uh, the, 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 one of their finest presidents ever. Yes, yes. I mean, we there there there, there are too many classified documents all the way. World War One, World War Two, nine eleven. There's there's too much that needs there's too too much truth has been concealed. I and I keep making the point in the intelligence community, in a democracy, there are things, we, we have the concept called the right to know, which you have heard of. Yes. In a democracy, the people have a right to know. Yes. A, a, a large number of things. They don't have a right to know who is the American head of station in Moscow, yes. but they do have a right to know who arranged the assassination of their elected president. In, yeah. a, in a democracy where a foreign power, in this case Germany, arranges for the assassination of an elected leader, the people of a democracy have an absolute right to know yes. who organized the murder of their elected president and why. Uh, 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 and they also are entitled to know how it was done, who, yeah. how, what. These are things that the American people have a right to know. Yes. And intelligence officers and analysts like myself, I'm not an intelligence officer, but I am an intelligence analyst. Intelligence analysts, those who are in the intelligence community in possession of the truth, have an obligation to tell. The, the yes. analog of the right, the public's right to know is the intelligence specialist's duty to tell. Correct. Right. Let's see if we can't make that happen. Wow. Uh, and, and in a democracy, the people the, uh, in a democracy, at the end of the day, the people ought to have the power. And uh, intelligence in the West, intelligence is about telling truth to power. There you go. There you go. Um, well, hopefully, we can make that happen. And at some point in time, I think we all people also just have one where we take questions because I, I have very happy yeah, it, it, timing. Taking questions is, is a function of time. Uh, it is. Uh, and it, it so happens that it's been an extremely hectic few weeks, as people can imagine, with the death of the sovereign, the, the funeral. Um, I'm gonna, uh, uh, it, when you have a change of government, I'm always busy, particularly if I'm being talked about as a member of the new government. Yes, uh, arranging briefings for the new government, uh, the changeover from, from uh, the changeover of sovereign, uh, the new sovereign has to be briefed in. Uh, you your new king. Yes, I think he. I think he'll be a wonderful king. Uh, behind the scenes, friends of mine were involved in briefing in the Queen. Uh, I was involved in briefing in. Well, I was involved in briefing in the Queen because I briefed in Prince Philip, and he was able to brief in the Queen on things like the Madeleine McCann kidnap and murder. Uh, but the the changeover of government is a busy time for me always. The changeover of monarch is a busy time for me always. 
Uh, and on top of that, I have my regular work as I've got four appearances in the High Court coming up in the next few weeks uh, involved in major habeas corpus test case. Um, you name it. Uh, uh, and we've had the war in the Ukraine. I've been trying yeah. to set up peace talks between Moscow and London and uh, Kiev, um, which Zelensky won't go with, but the President Putin has been very sensible about. Uh, the British Foreign Secretary. I've been trying to reach the you know, this week. I've been trying to reach the British Foreign Secretary to brief him in and uh, 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 arrange for a little yeah. meeting. Usual story: a little meeting at Checkers, uh, a little meeting not Checkers at Chevenon, uh, his country home. Just just a quiet little briefing and set up a little back channel to Moscow. That sort of thing. So That's the, 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 the with the war, and then we've had the energy crisis to deal with, and we've had this huge political crisis and attempted coup against the elected government in Britain. Uh, so my hands have been full over the last week. Yes. Well, hopefully uh, later in the month, it'll be a bit quieter. Um, November, hopefully it'll be a bit quieter, apart from Guy Fawkes night. And a three-way, I do, I really do like the idea of a three-way. I am years. working on it. Yeah. And there's, there's some other things that uh, we'll talk about. Uh, you, we'll you can tell, you can tell Ollie Stone from me and he can show, show by all means, forward the program, a copy of this, by all means, send him a link so he can see who I am and what, yes. I, what I sound like. And hopefully work out that I'm not a fo not an idiot. Yes. Uh, I, hopefully I don't look like an idiot. <laughs> there are those who say, uh, tough, 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 Michael. I'm afraid you do look a bit stupid, but uh, I, I hopefully don't look like a politician. Um, no. Uh, a three-way between you, me, and Oliver Stone, we can blow the whole Kennedy thing out of the water. We can blow the whole Kennedy conspiracy wide open. Well, that's what that's what I'm working on setting up, and um, I know Joseph had a lot of talks on that. And I think my my, my biggest contribution is to uh, remember what uh, what Jim Morrissey had to say about these uh, those issues, because I think he was uh, dead on for a lot. Uh, of Jim Mars. Yeah. Yes, I, I like Jim. Yes, I was on. Yeah, the program he had a lot of good points on that. On his radio program once. Yes, I I remember in Washington he uh, uh, interviewed me. Good man. Yeah. yeah. He was a good man. Anyway. Uh, Good morning. Not to tell you to go to bed, but go to bed and get rest. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, well, I'm not going to bed. I should be some hours before I before I hit the sack, I'm afraid. In that case, I'm going to go burn some fossil fuels on my Harley Davidson because that's all I have left to make me smile in California. Harley's a great bike. It is. I and love still... Harley's bits. Great. Uh, uh, not, not as good as a Norton Dominator, perhaps, but nevertheless, uh, <laughs> a very, a very fine American built machine. Uh, always loved Harley's. We'll see what we can do about that when you come out here. I will chat with you soon. And yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't ride on it because I'd, I'd wreck the bike. I'd fall off it. We'll give you a sidecar. A sidecar? Yeah, I need a sidecar. Yeah, I can't ride a bike. <laughs> I, I, I buy Harleys, but I can't ride. I can drive a car. I can fly a plane, but I can't ride a bike. <laughs> you have a good have a good evening out there, and I Thank will you. talk to you soon, and I will chat with you on a few things uh, over the next couple of weeks. Great. Okay. Great to good talk luck. to you. Be well. See you all soon. See you all soon.